Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm just taking a few moments to let you know that this clip that you will see after this introduction is from one of my online classes, and I've decided to edit them so that more people can benefit from these lectures that I deliver pretty much every week. So enjoy, and let me know what you think about it. Thank you so much. Today, we will start talking about section one or chapter one of the novel. Uh, there are quite a lot of things happening here, but the main movement, and you probably watched my two videos that cover certain pages. Those page numbers are from here. So you'll have to kind of reconcile the page numbers with the reader's page numbers. But we see, uh, the opening scenes we talked about, and then we are now where Marlowe takes the boat, a steamer to Africa, disembarks, then takes a boat upriver to the first station where he has to wait a few days and then tracks inwards about 60 miles. There isn't much of an account of that trekking except for the scene that he has a, another European accompanying him who needs to be carried. We get first impressions of the African characters, not necessarily characters, but presence of the enslaved labor in the first camp. And then we he gets to the central station where it's more about he understanding the whole operation the other Europeans there, the station master, and the section one ends where a new group of pilgrims that he calls them uh, is called the El Dorado expedition have just come in. To see whether this man who had come out equipped with moral ideas would climb to the top after all and how he would set about his work when there. So this was El Dorado exploring expedition and this they just have come in and so we get quite a lot here we can dwell on how Marlowe describes the natives right and uh, also what kind of a view does he has this of this entire operation there's a lot of foreshadowing to people European men going crazy hanging themselves or killing others also very descriptive scenes of the suffering of the natives. Now the vocabulary that is used is absolutely racist. There is no doubt about that. Marlowe sees the natives as certain prehistoric beings, but can we retrieve that he has a certain degree of empathy for what is being done to them or what is happening to them? That's debatable. Good, so yes. The El Dorado uh, group is basically, as we learn in the next section, it's a bunch of Europeans who have come in. They are being led by a person who is the uncle to the station master, and that prefigures in the next section very importantly. But these are just kind of the Europeans following the gold rush. Everyone who's there from Europe, you know, that's the sense we get. Even the guy, the overweight guy who can't make that, who's totally unfit for the track and has to be carried. When Marlowe asks him, why are you here? You can't even like, and he's like for money, for wealth. So all of these people are there under one disguise or the other to get rich. And the way the system, and you will learn it Marlowe explains it directly, indirectly uh, in the main station. Every one of the Europeans there walking around is hoping that they will be assigned as in charge of a trading post. Okay, When they get assigned as in charge of a trading post, then they are not just working you know, for a salary or something. They become partners in the company's profit. They start earning commission for any amount of ivory that they send down the river, right? So everyone is there. Greed is the main motivator here, okay? 
Next question is, is Marlowe sarcastic when he's talking about how a dead person was considered a permanent improvement to a road? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a dark humor. Uh, and uh, he is talking about that uh, with reference to a group being led by someone who claimed to be working on the road improvement. Right, their job is to maintain the road, but there is no road. It's just like the brick maker in the main camp whose job is to produce bricks. No one knows for what, but he he hasn't produced any bricks because there is some raw material that he's missing. Now think of it, if you are in a place where there is clay and there is, where is, where there is just simple earth and water, and sun and a f and firewood to burn the bricks how hard can it be or how impossible can it be to make bricks right the africans historically knew how to make them the indians knew how to make them sometimes they will just sun bake them so there is a certain degree of sarcasm and humor attached to the the whole mismanage of this management of this entire project, right? Where people, and you will see, I mean, he's there, he has to fix his boat and all he's waiting for is rivets. There are tons upon tons of them down the river, but somehow it takes him two months to get a bag of rivets. So what it's also talking about is how mismanaged that entire operation is, right? Does Marlowe has different views compared to the other Europeans due to his newness to Africa or is he more, uh, not necessarily his newness, but we already know that he's more traveled, right? Marlowe has come into this story as a narrator who has previously been in the Far East, right? He's a sailor, he has seen more of the world. And we already know that he has sort of a cynical approach to the project of capitalism itself. So his view, way of, he might be encountering the African natives for the first time, but he has encountered the Malay natives, the Indian natives, right? So his experience of other races is broader than these Europeans. And then he's not there as part of an expedition to extract ivory, right? So he is not a prospector. He is a steamboat captain. So his job is, you know, to captain the boat upriver, collect people, collect materials and bring down there. So we could say that primarily he didn't come to Africa, to Congo, because he assumed that if he became part of this expedition or this company, he will get rich, right? So these are some of the things that we could say make Marlowe, if not more progressive, he has a more complex view of the situation. He can look at it from a detached perspective, right? And see the futility of these actions. Okay. I, uh, sure. I also wanted to know, although I understand that Marlowe needed the rivets to repair his ship, is there any other symbolism in regard to the constant mention of the rivets? I don't read the symbolisms, but in the next section, you will see he overhears a conversation between the station master, who is the only one who doesn't fall ill, and he's absolutely suited for this environment, and his uncle, who has come in with the El Dorado expedition. So what we find out is that this delay, this non-delivery of rivets, isn't just necessarily because of the mismanagement. It could be deliberate because the station manager may not want Kurtz to survive. So we can construe that from the conversation that Marlowe overhears, right? But it could also be, if you want to read it symbolically, you could say, you know, in any given situation, sometimes the largest project fails because of a thing that we otherwise consider unimportant. Remember from Richard III, the scene, you know, where he says, my kingdom for a horse, right? And so maybe symbolically we learn that sometimes the most insignificant thing is the most 
important part of any operation. And, and planning that is important. Shori, there is a mention of a group of people known as pilgrims. Were these people in Africa for a... No, this is the same group, uh, the, uh, the El Dorado group. Marlowe calls them pilgrims. Now, one would assume that pilgrims are there for some religious purpose, but he immediately then tells us they, they are not religious pilgrims. They are there believing that they can drag gold out of whatever African terrain that they enter. So uh, that reference to them as pilgrims is kind of ironic. It's also ironic because they are riding donkeys, right? And they are probably uh, outwardly religious, but they are not there on a religious mission. They are a profitable organization, you know, who have come in and then they go into the wilderness. What happens to them? We don't really find out or we don't know. Some of them probably die. The donkeys die. Okay. Okay. What do you think the interaction on page 41 with the Danish dude and the villagers signified as? Uh, well, uh, that is interesting because what we get is the feeling, obviously, as far as we think of the Dane, you know, he's gone crazy, right? Fine. And he's beating up this village chief. So one thing that we learn is that the Europeans don't even understand the hierarchy, what not to do, right? So you don't grab the elder of a village and start beating up on them and expect no resistance, right? So these are unlike the British who went and studied the local hierarchies and then exploited them, right? Uh, these Europeans there have no clue how to understand the native culture. So it's colonialism through brute force, right? And that's why he gets killed, right? So it's a reference then again to the mere cultural brutality, but from Marlowe's point of view, as he tells the story, it's also, we, we could read it as the European going crazy or having absolute power over these natives and thinking that they can do whatever they want. And now keep in mind that people still do that, right? We have had modern warlike situations where, uh, you know, men with guns have gone to Africa, to somewhere else and declared themselves, you know, the masters and arbitrators of justice and all, and it is always related to power over other people. So we can also read it like that. Right? And, and Marlowe goes out of the way to suggest that, that, uh, that the Dane got killed accidentally, that he was being poked and died. Uh, that kind of is sad because it takes away any agencies from the natives. Uh, you know, the native tribes, in all rest of Africa fought really hard. I mean, the Zulu needed to be conquered, right? And they died in thousands and fought bravely. Pretty much all the major native tribes fought extremely hard. And when they kicked the Europeans out of their territories, most of them fought really hard. Uh, so there is a certain mythology at play here of a passive native not knowing what to do and that is highly racialized, right? Okay. All right, good questions. Now, another thing to keep in mind here is uh, what impression we get, you know, of this entire operation from Marlowe's point of view, right? Uh, from the first meeting that he has is with, with the accountant, right? and the absurdity of this accountant with the starched shirt and everything sitting in his ramshackle office maintaining accounts because that is crucial. So what must he be accounting for, right? How much ivory has come down, how much ivory has been sent down the river, and then how many materials, beads, and these cheap trading things have come in and have been set, sent forward, right? And so he is a very important part of the, the this whole mechanism, right? 
but kind of his approach to life and people around him is kind of absurd because he doesn't care about the person dying in his own room. All he cares about is to keep his books straight, which is the kind of detachment maybe you need to sustain like an environment like that. Well, that's a good question. So we don't know if he intentionally damaged the steamer, but we can guess from the conversation that Marlowe overhears that there is a cons conspiracy afoot. And that conspiracy involves delaying Curtis, Curtis's return, hoping that he will die out there. And as we get to that section, we will talk more about it. Marlowe says he had a childhood fantasy of going to Africa. It was blank. On, do you think this is the only reason for why he went, if not money? Well, I mean, it's that is even mentioned in the earlier part of the book. But there is also an irony in there because what he's linking it to also is not just the fantasy about the blank places on earth, but also a certain people asserting that they have the right to govern another people, maybe if they have flat noses, darker skin. So there is a slight critique of that impulse. But this idea of blank places on the earth is the role of cartography in colonialism, right? So when the maps were made by Europeans, right? of Americas or Africa, they will make the places look blank, right? Even though people lived there, thousands upon thousands of people lived there. Because if you could, you could imagine a place as empty, then you could tell yourself, oh, I'm going to go tame this wilderness and make it civilized. That's exactly what happens in, in the American West, right? The opening of the American West or in North America, the land was inhabited, but it was imagined to be empty, right? Because if you could do that, then you could lay claim to it. The famous uh, edict of uh, Pope Pius VI, who, who uh, the uh, theologically gave the account of uh, the law of discovery, right? The moral law of discovery that the land belonged to those who had discovered it and not, not necessarily to those who had lived there. That edict of, pope, of the Pope was used by the Catholics to claim the parts of Africa that they came to. Uh, so th that is a hint at that, you know, but I don't think so. That's the only thing that brings Marlowe there. I mean, pragmatically, he's looking for a job. No one wants to hire him, but he is a sailor, right? So he's offered a job to captain a steamboat. So it's a job that has brought him here, but it also separates him from the others because the job isn't to come and be a trading post in charge and extract ivory. The job is to probably transport that ivory. He's still part of that company, but he's not there primarily as a prospector or as someone whose fortune is connected to the amount of ivory that he collects. Obviously, it looks like he's a salaried employee of the company, right? Because he's going to be a boat captain. So that's what brings him. And of course, you can always account for his sense of adventure, right? Because he romanticizes this kind of adventure in Africa or going up the river as a sailor offers him that. So absolutely that's part of him. Well, no, I won't say that was characteristic of Conrad's era because there are novels already in which Africans appear as fully realized human beings. Even in romantic novels like, like H. Ryder Haggard and others, while well, to attribute dark things and all that might have been acceptable. But for a, novel, a novelist of Conrad's caliber to refer to Africans in this vocabulary is absolutely a choice. I mean, there is nothing at that time 
in English language which says that Africans should be represented like this. Now, why does he make that choice? That's a different question, whether it is racist or whether he's trying to display through Marlowe that these people have been reduced to these non-human entities, but that is obviously a choice. And there is nothing wrong in reading that representation as racist, right? Um, I, I've always had problem with this argument that these people were product of their times. So the way they talked about Africans was no. Like right when we, we like here in American scene, when we try to, uh, you know, refer to, you know, even the third president, what was his name? The so-called philosopher owning slaves and having certain views about African Americans, right? And saying that he was a product of his time is wrong because there were thousands upon thousands of abolitionist pub publications out there. So if he was a reading man, he should have read them, right? And it wasn't like the knowledge about slavery being bad was not being produced and a, a large segment of society believed in it. So if, if that kind of subterfuge, I, I don't agree to or believe in. To me, it was a choice. And there is a whole, uh, Edward Said has a wonderful study of this uh, in his earlier work, but also in his later work where he, you know, and that's what Achebe points out too, is that if you just look at the language, what language is used to describe the land, the people, the adjectives, you already can tell that Conrad is going out of his way to represent this space as absolutely dark and menacing. And, and, and the human beings, the African beings in it, none of them is offered as a fully realized human being, right? And that's why Achebe, you know, goes and writes things fall apart, which gives us the story of Africans, you know, who have a culture, who have language, who have poetry, who have customs, good and bad. So the idea is to give us a story of Africa in which Africans themselves are the main characters. Now, also in this section, uh, we also get a snippet of the main narrator entering the story for a little bit. And that happens on uh, at the place where he says, do you see him? Do you see the story? Do you see anything? It seems to me I'm trying to tell you a dream, making a vain attempt, because no relation of a dream can convey the dream sensation, that co-mingling of absurdity, surprise, and bewilderment. In a tremor of struggling revolt, the notion of being captured by the incredible, which is the very essence of dreams. And this is when he's talking about, um, you know, the guy who was the, supposed to be making bricks is trying to lie to him, is trying to extract information from him. Because everyone thinks he, Marlowe, is somehow connected to the centralized management, right? And then Marlowe talks about the wilderness and that is where the main narrator enters briefly. And he says, he was silent for a while. No, it's impossible. It's impossible to convey the life sensation of any given epoch of one's existence. That which makes its truth, its meaning, its subtle and penetrating essence. It is impossible. We live as we dream alone. And then we hear the main narrator again. He paused again as if, reflecting, then added, of course, in this you fellows see more than I could then. You see me whom you know, right? He's talking to the audience, right? It had become so pitch dark that we listeners could hardly see one. Now, this is our main narrator, one another. For a long time already, he sitting apart had been no more to us than a voice. There was not a word from anybody. The others might have been asleep, but I was awake. I listened. I listened on the watch for the sentence, for the word that would give me the clue to the faint uneasiness inspired by this narrative that seemed to shape itself without human lips in the heavy night air of the river. And then 
Marlowe enters the story again. So this is one of those interruptions by the main narrator, I guess strategically kind of drawing us to the scene, the setting that this is a story being told. But as you might have noticed, if you didn't read it carefully, you might have even missed it. But as, as Marlowe starts telling the story, we forget that he's sitting on the deck of a ship telling the story. We imagine ourselves along with him in Africa. And I think that makes it a really compelling narrative strategy or technique. Another thing to keep in mind is that what we can also learn from this novel is, is also uh, how sometimes such vocabularies are still employed, right? In politics, in cultural debates, in living, breathing racism that people encounter every day or sexism that people encounter every day, right? So anytime someone tells you, hey, you're a girl, you shouldn't do this, right? They are trying to use a certain ideology, a certain way of defining gender, right? And, and that essentializes people in their gender role, in their identity, right? Or if you encounter someone who's a racist these days, um, you know, it's not like they don't know the vocabularies that they are using. They exactly know the vocabularies that they are using and they use it for that effect, right? Calling people names, call, giving them different kind of attributes, fixed attributes. So these things still are operative wherever we live, in our culture here, in the post-colonial societies themselves. Um, go to Pakistan, you know, you will see class hierarchies, you will see caste hierarchies, you will see hierarchies of color. Same in India, right? I just read a news, uh, news uh, paper article last week, I don't think so, I think it was New York Times, where what they mentioned was that uh, since there is a huge Indian diaspora population in the United States, um, a lot of these communities, they have also somehow imported the caste prejudices, right? So if you're a powerful businessman and believe in the hierarchy of caste system, what has come out is that these people, if they find out you are from a lower caste or whatever, they will ostracize you. Right. So these prejudices are even happening within the minority communities whom we might consider as a monolith, whom we might consider as, OK, these are oppressed minorities. They should be together. There are then prejudices of race, ethnicity, religion, even among the oppressed communities themselves. Right. So. Here we already see the European dominant racist ideology at play, right? Okay. I have a, okay, Scorpion Studios, you have to tell me your real name. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kurt's painting holds a deeper significance to Marlowe. Why is Marlowe so interested in finding an example of a sophisticated European man? Why does Marlowe detest the men around him? OK, so let's kind of figure out uh, what are the things these men do that Marlowe doesn't like. We already know that Marlowe doesn't like their greed, right? Marlowe also doesn't like if they are conniving, right? So even though the brick maker seems to be an educated person and reads, right? and looks like he is a cultured person, Marlowe simply doesn't like him because he doesn't do anything. And two, he's conniving. He's trying to extract information out of Marlowe, assuming that Marlowe is not smart enough to figure that out. So Marlowe doesn't like sloth. He doesn't like people who are just in it for money. He respects people who are upfront and strong, like the office manager, right? But by and large, the kind of persona that is given to Marlowe is of a skeptic. I mean, this is a person who actually, if you read it carefully, doesn't believe in any religious ideology, can barely take the 
Western civilization notion seriously. He's a sailor. He obviously has no loyalty to any crown or any country. His only loyalty is, of course, to the sea, right? So he is kind of a skeptic, right? You have to really convince him to earn his respect. And maybe that's the kind of narrator Conrad creates, like a person who doesn't trust much, who has opinions about things, but some of those opinions are very clear. He doesn't like the rapacious nature of what these people are there for. He has no patience for the ineffectual European men walking around, you know, in the camp, not knowing what to do. And so, so if you made a list of the things that he mentions that he disdains and dislikes, it would be pretty much the whole operation that he has entered into. Um, and maybe Conrad needed a narrator like that, a narrator who is hypercritical of the very milieu that he's entering. And we already know that Marlowe never thinks that he is part of this organization. That, that, he is looking at it as an outsider, but as an experienced outsider, not a naive outsider, right? And maybe that's what we should keep in mind. Was there significance to Marlowe's interaction with the doctor? I understand that it foreshadows the supposed danger, but why is the doctor interested in seeing Wow, that's a good point. It's a foreshadowing. But remember, there is a reference to a study that the doctor is planning to perform. And the study, as we can glean or guess from that, is, is the study of the effects of African experience on the brains of European men. Okay, It's a pseudo-study, right? But remember, not a hundred years before the novel is set, there were field of sciences that were called something like phrenology. Now, the medicine students can tell me what that was. But phrenology claimed to be a scientific field of study which by, with, in which measuring the skull sizes and the angle between the forehead and the nose the researchers claimed that they could prove which was a superior race and which was an inferior race. Well, totally BS science, right? So we are in that era. So the doctor foreshadowing in a sense that the doctor measures his head. But if you are a scientist claiming to be a scientist and you have sent out these people out in the world, but you also want to make them into test subjects. So you can't just rely on the data that you collected when you sent them out. What is more important to you is to collect the data when they come back, right? So that's why he's interested in collecting the measurements of the skull and everything else when these people came back so that he can scientifically maybe lay claim to this idea that when European men go to the wilderness, especially this wilderness, scientifically their bodies alter, their brains alter, and they become crazy. So that is what is hinted at, right? And and yeah, it is absolutely important. That foreshadowing is already there. We get that. We find out that two other men have come back and they have kind of lost their senses. We get the idea as soon as he gets on a steamer with the Swede of the idea of the other sailor who had hanged himself, the Swede who goes crazy. So all along, we are getting these narratives is that something is happening to these European men, other than those who are dying of you know, diseases. And then the ultimate madness of it is the figure of Kurtz himself, right? Who is built up throughout the novel, right? Throughout the story. Yes, um, yes, polygenesis, or uh, there was another concept, there was another book uh, called The Wild Man's Pedigree, and 16th, 17th century. 
so what these in that what they would do is they would like classify different races and attribute different qualities to them i think we talked about it too and so there was a lot of this kind of research to prove you know how one race was superior to other innately inherently right and uh, essentially right and so this kind of this kind of pseudo research falls into the same category and i mean think of it this way it's now people the races here still use that they use all those pseudo sciences right this whole idea of uh, of eugenics and genetics um, it's still prevalent in today's united states of america the politicians use it uh, all these racist websites use it right so what is one form of racism is where you assign certain negative attributes to a racial group and you make them essential you say these people will always do that that is what converts that into a fixed form of racism right um, and you you hear those arguments even now the narrator speaks about the sound of the drum as suggestive and wild however he also goes on to say that perhaps they are they have a meaning profound as bells in good point so uh, marlo another thing that marlo does throughout the story is you will see and you can point it out is that he first gives us the surface impression of something right dark quiet right or thick forest right and then he gives us his own interpretation or a certain deeper view of it right and that is stylistically really interesting because the first thing you hear is the drums right so he mentions the drums right and then he also alludes maybe they have a deeper meaning right and and that adds another layer to it but the experience the sound itself is offered as this ominous mysterious sound now we know our outside from our outside the text readings and experience that you know drums were used as a messaging code right they were also used in rituals and everything else but in africa you know the messengers brought the messages but sometimes the drums were used to send messages from when one village to another right and that's another aspect of it that we don't know but here at least there is some understanding that he is at least attributing some spiritual aspect to that that sound so i think i honored i answered this one this juxtaposition of the apparent impression of something and then adding a deeper layer to it right good questions kevin at the very let's go here when uh, conrad describes the africans as bundles of acute angles and other phrases could this be him trying to make colonization not necessarily like but if you look at that scene right what he's trying to do is show how these living breathing people have been reduced to the level of things right because they are you know they are in heaps some of them are dying they are exhausted right um, and so they come across as things but that kind of redeems it because we also know what has reduced them to that 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 is not their natural state the system that has enslaved them has used their labor has kind of when he goes through that grove where so many of the native slaves are dying there is never any hint that they are just chosen to die it is that what is being done to them has driven them to that state so that to me is somewhat what redeems conrad right because the natives are not inherently offered 
as lazy and weak. The representation, they represent their thingification is within the context of what is being done to them by these Europeans. And that we can read more carefully like that. At the very end of part one, Marlowe says he wasn't very interested in Kurds, but was curious about whether Kurds would climb to the top. So what he's trying to say is there is a hint throughout when people talk about Kurds. <clears throat> it's hinted that Kurds is, uh, is very dear to the company's European hierarchy, that he is being groomed for a future managerial position and that if he returns from here alive and healthy he will take on some major administrative role within the company and so this reference then is you know would Kurtz survive and then go back and get to the top of this company because that is what along with his myth as the most productive trading post in charge is this idea that he is exceptional and he is being groomed to take on a leadership position in the company. So that is what the reference is. Now in section two, as you read it, read the conversation that Marlowe overhears while sleeping in his boat, right? lying in his boat between the station master and the in charge of the El Dorado expedition. It's kind of really uh, interestingly done, but read that carefully because that would tell you that there is a conspiracy against Kurtz, not to kill him, but to make sure that somehow because of the wilderness itself, he doesn't make it back but you have to read it very carefully to figure that out. Okay, Marlowe tells to his shipmates that women view their voyage as saving the Africans instead of for profit. Um, wouldn't most men living in Europe at that time think this way as well? Well, I mean, that's a hard question to answer because Mostly you would say that people who were deeply religious, like Christian, practicing Christians, would be the ones who would think, who would even forgive certain atrocious acts or bad behavior because they would believe that, well, at least the Bible is getting there. At least the word of God is getting there. But not the majority of them. Remember, most of this colonization and the colonizations of America and India were carried out by private corporations. Right? What was the East India Company? East India Company was a private enterprise given the charter by the king right, to go to India, establish trade relationships, extract resources, right? Until 1858, India wasn't directly governed by the crown. It was governed by a corporation. Similarly, the Hudson Bay Company. So these were profit earning organizations. Now, religion and the civilizing mission was used to rationalize you know, this occupation of Africa or India and elsewhere. It worked. Maybe you could recruit some very earnest fellows who would say, well, I am there. I'm going to take the word of God there. And of course, there were plenty of clergy and religious people who go there to these places to bring God's word to the people. But there were plenty who also knew, you know, this is East is a career, right? As it really says that. Who, were, who knew that, you know, they weren't even going to go there and make a new life, right? Like unlike Americas, you know, when they came to America, they were like, we are going to go and create a new life there. These people knew they were never going to live in Africa. 
right, other than South Africa and those parts which has a settler population, most of these people were on an extraction mission, on a get rich mission, right? So Africa then was this resource from where they could dig out whatever they want, bring it back to Europe and live their lives happily ever after. Good questions. All right, so we've been talking for about 50 minutes. So I'm going to stop here. Let me scroll up and see if I missed anyone's question. If I did, please remind me next time and I'll answer it. OK, sounds good. So I'm going to stop here. We uh, are going to stop our conversation of section one or chapter one. And next week, we'll talk about chapter two. OK, or section two, whatever you want to call it. But do keep in mind that we will refer to section one and what happens here. It's not like they're like totally detached. But then my hope is that by the next week, you know, after this, we'll finish the novel and then move on to shorter pieces, right? And that's my hope. But if you have any questions, send them my way, email me or put it on the discussion board and I'll be happy to answer them. But that's all I have for today, right? Um, now, one of them I forgot, I'll have to look at the email. And even if I knew the name, I will not mention it here, of course, had asked me to write a recommendation letter. But uh, I will not be able to write a recommendation letter until the end of the semester, after I know how you did, how you performed, what your grade is. So I would highly recommend that you ask a professor with whom you did finish a course and did well to write your recommendation letters, especially for admissions, because you don't want a generic letter. You want a letter from someone who really knows your work because college applications are highly competitive. And having sat on admission committees, I can promise you that good letters do count towards your admission. OK, so that's all I have for today. And uh, that means we will now meet next week. And anything new that comes up, I will post it on the website. And you will be able to see it. Uh, the next journal prompt was already there. I gave you one or two extra days, I think. But even if you are late, right? please upload the journal. There is no penalty for that. right? The only penalty is if you choose not to do it. And then there is nothing for there for me to give any points to. So that's all from me today. Thank you so much for your time. And I will see you all next week. OK, bye. So this concludes this edited version of a live lecture. I'll be back with more. And please keep an eye out for these. And I hope these are useful to you. Thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.